بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, I would like to welcome you to your masjid, Masjid Al-Furqan. And we are also very honored to have with us tonight uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr Zawd, all the way from Australia. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that, uh, how many of you have ever been to Australia? Raise your hand. Only maybe a few people. Few don't, people have been to. Don't come, don't come. Okay, only a few people have been to Australia. <laughs> that shows you how far, mashallah, how far away where the Sheikh has come from, mashallah, it's very far. But I can tell you, I've gone past Australia. I, got all the way to, I went all the way to New Zealand. Uh, so I was actually on transit. And uh, I went to Sydney, and then after that went to New Zealand. So that was, that was a little bit further away from, uh, uh, from, from Australia. So we would like to welcome the Sheikh, Sheikh Abu Bakr. So tonight is his first visit uh, to Masjid Al-Furqan. Uh, we would like to welcome him and say to him, inshallah ta'ala, welcome uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr to your masjid and to your community. And we are looking forward to this uh, lecture, which is called and titled, How to Deal with Modern Day Fitnah. So we are pleased to, inshallah ta'ala, listen to this talk and benefit from the Sheikh, bi'idnillahi ta'ala. You spoke, you spoke very good English. <laughs> the, sh the Sheikh will simplify it, inshallah. 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 Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Of course at the beginning in support of what the brother said that is actually true. And in knowledge, the foundation and the essence of knowledge is in the Arabic language. And this is the language that Allah Azza wa Jal chose for his final revelation. And this is the language of the people of the paradise. Uh, but it is unfortunate that over time, people have lost their connection with the Arabic language. And hence, my dear brother, yani excuse us, because وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ Allah Azza wa Jal, He said that He sent the messengers to their people بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ With the language and the tongue of the people so that He can clarify to them the message of Allah Azza wa Jal. So if I did sit and spoke in Arabic for one hour, I don't think that the message will, will be clear to all of us that are sitting here. And so this is why we choose to speak in the English language. Not that we want to do so, but because this is what is relevant. So forgive us, my dear brother, or jazakallah khaira. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal that he grant us all the ability to learn the Arabic language and to master it. And I just heard from one of the mashayikh here that there is a program and a, and a plan to teach this local community the Arabic language. So if you're able to register into that, then do so. Inshallah ta'ala, you will not lose anything. Rather, you will gain immense benefit, bi'ithnillah. My brothers and sisters in Islam, tonight's topic is titled, How to Deal with Modern Day Fitan. And this is a topic that is often repeated and always spoken about. We need to understand first and foremost what's the importance of this topic and why do we continuously share reminders concerning this matter? How to deal with modern day fitan? How do you protect yourself? How do you shield yourself against the fitan that are either from a shubuhat or a shahawat, al fitan that are faith based related and fitan that are 
related to desire and temptation. This topic is always shared. Why? Because the most valuable thing you own in life is your relationship with Allah, which is your Iman and your Tawheed, your La ilaha illallah. That's the most valuable matter that you own. Your La ilaha illallah. That's why in Adhkar al-Sabah wal masa if you're regular and you say them and you know something about them, one of the dua is to say, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-afwa wal-afiyah. What? Fi dini wa dunyai. Oh Allah, I seek your protection. Protect me in my religious matters, in my deen, and then in my worldly affairs. See this order? This order is on purpose. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would teach us to ask Allah azza wa jal that he protect our deen first. Protect my deen. Protect my la ilaha illallah. Protect my Islam. Oh Allah, keep me consistent upon the prayers. And keep me away from sin and desire and everything else that taints and tarnishes and destroys my iman. Then you say, wa dunyai. And then protect my worldly matters, right? Your business and your marriage and your whatever it is that is worldly related. That's secondary, it comes second. Because the day you die, a dunya doesn't matter to you anymore. Khalas, it's all gone. Finished. You will not take anything with you. Even if a person had a golden tooth and he was buried and his family, not friends, his family, if they remembered that there was a golden tooth, they'll dig him up and they'll remove the tooth and they'll put him back in. You will go with nothing of this worldly life, right? And this is his family members. So this is why عَافِنِي fi دِينِي A deen is number one. This is what you always want to observe and be careful of and make sure it's protected and safeguarded. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ حَقَّ تُقَاتِهِ وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ That's a command from Allah Azza wa Jal. He said, don't you dare die except in a state of submission. That's what Allah is saying. He's saying to us, be careful. Make sure you die upon La ilaha illallah, upon Islam, upon Iman. You know the prophets from their dua was to ask Allah Azza wa Jal to cause their death upon La ilaha illallah. If you look at the situation of Yusuf alayhi salam, in Surah Yusuf at the end he would say what? Tawaffani muslima wa alhiqni bis saliheen. My Lord, cause my death upon Islam. This is a prophet. Look, a prophet is someone who is already guaranteed the paradise. Because this is a person who Allah entrusted with his message. This person's already got a green light. Prophets are examples and role models for others. But even then he will make the dua tawaffani muslima. See how important al-iman wal-islam wa deen is. Ibrahim alayhi salam or Yaqub alayhi salam, he's on his deathbed. He's about to die. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, أَمْ كُنْتُمْ شُهَدَاء إِذْ حَبَرَ يَعْقُوبَ الْمَوْتِ Allah Azza wa Jal says, were you there when Ya'qub was dying? No, we weren't there. We physically weren't there. So Allah Azza wa Jal will tell us what happened. He said, إِذْ حَبَرَ يَعْقُوبَ الْمَوْتِ إِذْ قَالَ لِبَنِيهِ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِ When death presented itself to Ya'qub, and he was about to die, he had his children around him. From among them is Yusuf alayhi salam, a prophet of Allah. He says to his children, what are you going to worship after my departing? After I die, what are you worshipping? He did not say to them, the lands that we own, who's going to take it? He's got any decision on it? My wealth, what are you going to do with it? My assets and my business and whatever it is he had of all the matters. He didn't ask anything. 
of what they're going to do and how they're going to disperse it and divide it among themselves. In fact, prophets, they don't inherit or they don't leave as inheritance anything of the worldly matters. The thing that he asked them about was the greatest concern that he had for them. مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِي What are you going to worship after I die? They said, قَالُوا نَعْبُدُ إِلَاهَكَ وَإِلَاهَ آبَائِكَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ إِلَاهًا وَاحِدًا وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ We're going to worship your Lord. And we're going to be of those who submit to his command. وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ so you get the ID. The very first important matter in your life that you need to safeguard and protect and preserve is your Iman. You want to die upon La ilaha illallah? That's the goal in life. That's when you would have achieved something. If you die upon La ilaha illallah, you have succeeded in this life and in the afterlife. And if you lose La ilaha illallah, then you have lost this life and the afterlife. Huge damage. This is why we continuously speak about how to protect yourself from fitan in today's modern time. Al fitan, my brothers and sisters in Islam, is every matter that distracts you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what al fitna is. Al fitna is every matter that distracts you and affects your relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal in a negative manner. There are fitan that, as we said, shubuhat and shahawat. Fitan are of two types. Shubuhat, they are faith-based fitan. So this is all the type of isms that we have today and all the type of doubts that people will have about Islam and about Allah Azza wa Jal and concerning the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is where uh, atheism comes, or liberalism and feminism, and all these type of isms. That's known as fitan, or faith-based fitan. And of course, this is very relevant today. It exists in the Western world, and it slowly and surely has crept and made its way into the Muslim environment and in the Muslim community. So now you have Muslims that are affected by these isms. They have actually fallen into doubt concerning their deen. We get messages and receive messages. Brother, I am actually starting to doubt the existence of Allah and Islam. I'm doubting. I had a message once from a sister who had come across a hadith in which the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that the blood money, the blood money of a man who is killed accidentally is what? A hundred camels. And a woman that is killed accidentally, her blood money is 50 camels. So I have doubt. How can a woman's blood be cheaper than a male and a man's blood? Why 50 camels here and 100 camels here? And so I have doubt in Islam. Perhaps Islam is a misogynistic religion. This is what her doubt is. So we need to take time out to clarify and explain. We say, sister, relax. There's nothing to be concerned of. In fact, I said to her, I'll explain it to you. And you will find exactly how just Allah is. And you'll love this explanation. And you'll never have a doubt ever again concerning this matter. What is the solution? The clarification is, and I'll only clar clarify it because I gave you this kind of matter and I opened it. And that is that when the man dies, his blood money is what? A hundred camels. Who does it go to? To his family. Now the apparent is that his wife and children are alive. So the woman gets a hundred camels. Tayyib, the woman that dies accidentally, was killed accidentally, her blood money is what? 
50, that 50 goes where? If she has a husband and a it goes to the male. So you see the ID? When we said that the blood money of a man was a hundred camels, that 100 didn't go to him. He didn't benefit, but he's dead. It went to the woman. You see how just that is? Because a woman is a woman that perhaps is at home looking after her children, doesn't have an income, doesn't have a, a financial independence, right? So as a result, she needs a lot more. But the man ideally is the one who's working in society. He's the one that's earning a livelihood for his family and so on. So he takes 50 camels. The matter is done. So these are doubts, or they, they're known as shubuhat, faith-based doubts. And if you continue to read these doubts and expose your mind and your ears to them, then you will, your heart continues to be affected with doubts until a person begins to question his deen until he leaves the deen altogether. And how does a person protect himself from faith-based doubts? Of course, the very easy way is to just keep away from them. Don't listen to any podcast that is going to express disbelief and that's going to express doubts concerning Islam. Leave it. Keep away from it. Don't bring it to your heart and to your ears. Because what the ear doesn't hear and what the eye doesn't see most surely does not affect the heart. You have Al-Quran. Go and read that. Go and listen to that. If you had two hours, three hours to spare to listen to a podcast full of disbelief and doubts, then surely you had those three hours to listen to something of Quran or Islam that would have strengthened that iman and repelled and threw away the doubts. But you see, shaitan has fooled us and tricked us. We destroy ourselves with our own hands. And then there are fitan that are related to shahawat, desires and temptations, such as al-mal, wealth. Wealth is a fitna. When a person begins to collect it, from haram sources. It becomes a fitna. So now today, people don't care. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a time will come, la yubali al-mar, a person will not care where he gets his money from. People will not care whether he steals it, whether he's cheating, whether he's robbing others whether he's selling matters of haram and making his money from haram, from drugs, from shisha, from alcohol, from whatever it is, doesn't matter. The only thing he's concerned with is to collect and gather. And the fitna, this, this money becomes a fitna for him. Il fitan as well from today, in today's modern day, il fitan of uh, social media and followers, and likes and shares and growing on the online world and presenting himself as a role model to the world. Hadi fitna, if it is misused and abused, right? And the youth, where do they get this ID from? They see others on social media and they take them as role models and I want to be like them. So they create accounts for themselves and they try to do the same acts and say the same words and the same beliefs as those they found big in the social media industry. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that from the signs of the end of time, وَكَانَ زَعِيمُ الْقَوْمِ أَرْذَلَهُمْ That the chief or the influences at the end of time would be أَرْذَلَهُمْ the most evil among them. This is hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We see it in our day. The worst among them will be a zaim, will be the chief, will be the leaders, will be the influencers. So these are fitan 
that are related to evil temptation because there is a temptation for people to become famous and to have a following and a like. Also from Al-Fitan on social media especially, Fitnatun Nisa, the fitna of women. And this is something in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam emphasized and highlighted to his companions. Before he told us, he said to them, the most fitna I fee for you, and the worst of the fitan I fee that will come upon you is fitnatun nisa, adarru fitnatin ala rijal, the most harmful fitna upon men, women. And look at this fitna today, look how easy it is. It's on billboards, in ads, you know, long time ago, someone would drive, you'd look up, you can see the sky. You look up, now there are billboards and ads of all sorts of women wearing whatever they want. And they are painted in whichever image that is put, nakedness, and it's normalized. Hadi fitan. This is fitan. These matters are not to be taken and seen lightly. And not only that now, you don't need to lift your head anymore to the billboards and the posters. You can drop your head as well. See ya. Anyone who has these social media and he's not careful, you open and you scroll through and you are forced, you are bound to see Al-Haram. And over time, if you're not protecting and safeguarding your heart and yourself, you fall into Al-Haram. You see one image after another. It leads you to another and another until Allah, what happens to such a person? The heart becomes Ruined and destroyed and black. See al fitan what they do? And all these desires and then temptations, they cramp up onto the heart. And when the heart is black and it's full with sins and desires and evil temptations, one image after another, haram after haram being consumed, what happens? That's when the heart begins to doubt al-Islam and doubt Allah Azza wa Jal and doubt the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because it is an abundance of shahawat that leads to fitnatu shubuhat that's how it is so the idea is these are al-fitan and we need to understand and learn that the only way the only way to stand before Allah Azza wa Jal with La ilaha illallah is to safeguard this heart from these fitan. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, تُعْرَضُ الْفِتَنُ عَلَى الْقُلُوبِ عُودًا عُودًا That the fitan and the evil temptations are going to be presented upon the heart one straw after another. العود it's, you know the, the straw mats? You see the straw mat, how, how it's put all together? There's straws and they're all right after each other and it creates a mat. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the fitan will be exposed to the heart in that same manner. Meaning they're going to come one after the other. Run it really quick. And they're all after each other. You want to have a break. You will need to learn how to save yourself and how to shield yourself and how to protect yourself. Then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَأَيَّمَا قَلْبٍ أُشْرِبَهَا Any heart that engages with the fitna and accepts it into his life and is pleased and happy with it and normalizes it in his life. نُكِتَ فِي قَلْبِهِ نُكْتَةٌ سَوْدَاء A black dot is inscribed on his heart. Next fitna comes and you engage with it, another black dot. And another black dot, and we continue with black dots. Look, my brothers and sisters in Islam, and if I took a texter now or a marker, and I came to your cloth, and I began to put dots on your cloth, you'll become frustrated, right? And in fact, you will remove your cloth and you will go and wear something that is clean, right? But did you know that if I got the texter? and I scribbled on your clothes and I colored it with the black, it is much easier than one black dot on the heart. Let me, this is clothing. 
That's not going to go with you on the day of judgment. You're not going to be judged on how many white or black dots that are on the cloth. That gets thrown away. You're going to be judged on every black dot that is on the heart. So the idea is, just like you are concerned to wash your clothes from any dirt that comes on it, you have to have that same attitude with the dirt that is on the heart that comes from the fitan and engaging with them. Any heart that interacts with this fitna and doesn't do anything to move away from it. He's sitting, he's waiting for it. He loves to bring it into his life. He doesn't care. What's the problem? Everyone's doing it. Everyone in society is doing it. Why do I have to be different? Okay. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Hatta tasir al qulubu ala qalbain. The hearts in society will become two types. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, uh, also in the continuation of that hadith, and anyone who repels and rejects the fitna and does his utmost best to keep away from it, then he will have a white dot inscribed in his heart. The heart becomes more and more polished. Yes. Every time you step away from the fitna, do not think that, oh, I just lost a moment of temptation. I could have gained such and such. Wallahi, walking away from al-fitna, walking away from al-haram, walking away from the sin, that in itself is iman. That's how iman is practiced. Don't think that, oh, I just walked away and I walked away empty-handed. I didn't benefit anything. Look, this is exactly what Iman is. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ittaqi al-maharim takun a'bad al-nas. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, keep away from the haram, keep away from these fitan, and you will be the most righteous servant. A'bad al-nas. Look, everyone can do good. A lot of people do charity work, right? A lot of people can pray. A lot of people read Quran. Well, we can all do good. But it's only the sincere, honest, righteous sleeve that keeps away from sins and keeps away from fitan. That's hard work. But that's iman right there. It's being practiced. You don't walk away empty handed. Hasanatun kamila. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, anyone who was concerned to do a sin, Anyone who was concerned to engage with a fitna, you're there at home, at night, in the middle of the night, with your phone. No one can see you. Your parents are not there. Your wife is not there. The husband is not there. And you attempted to open your phone and to scroll through adult content. But then you said, you know what? I won't do this. And you threw your phone away and you walked away from al haram. You see what happens there? Kutibat lahu hasanatun kamila. Allah Azza wa Jal would record for you one hasana. One hasana that you didn't do. But because you walked away from al haram, don't ever think that if you walk away from al fitan, you lost. Rather, you gained. And you, that's iman. That, 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 that's how you increase al iman. This is it. And I said to al-ulama, rahimahumullah, they discussed a matter. They said, which one is better? Keeping away from al-haram or engaging in voluntary deeds? They gave an example. I ask you, which one is better? Someone, let's say you, you, for you individually to pray the entire night salatul layl and read 20 ajza, or for you, to be tempted to do a sin and walk away from it. Which of the two is better? Walk away from the sin. Yes. Why? Because avoiding the sin is wajib. Praying the entire night is mustahab. And the wajib takes precedence over that which is voluntary. You understand? So if you fought yourself during the night and you struggled against yourself, 
to keep, and you battled yourself to keep away from the sin. Wallahi, this is more rewarding for you than if you stood to pray the night voluntary salat. And keep doing this, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Don't give up. Don't normalize a sin and a fitna in your life. Because that's the sign of a dead heart. And if the heart has died, we're in trouble. You don't want the heart to die. If you continue to follow fitan and sins, because remember, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says they're going to come one after the other. If you continue to give in and you continue to go down that path, al fitan is like a, a slippery slide. Once you sit on it and you push yourself, you go down. And as you're going down, you go really quick. And that's the path to Jahannam. That's how it is. The hellfire has been surrounded with desires and sins and temptations and fitan. So you need to teach yourself that if you, you, got, you have to keep fighting. Tawbah. Every night. Struggle. Never give up. Don't say, you know what? I can't do this anymore. I've done Tawbah 30, 40, 50 times and I keep falling in the same sin. Khalas, I can't do it, man. I just have to give up to this sin. Khalas, that's it. That's me. That's me and that's the sin. I have to just give up. Wallah, that's dangerous. I tell you something. For you, to die as a fighter, as a mujahid against your sin and against your desire is much better than to die having given up in Allah's mercy and forgiveness. At least on the day of judgment, you're, you're resurrected a mujahid. You're resurrected someone who fought his desire, fought the sin. That's better to meet Allah Azza wa Jal in this manner than to meet him having given up on a tawbah. Khalas, I can't do this tawbah anymore. That's it. I accept and embrace the fact that I just consume adult content every day. Khalas, that's it. I've embraced this fact. That's it. I can't be bothered for a tawbah anymore. Wallah, you are setting yourself up for trouble. Don't give up. It's a fight. It's a battle between you and a shaitan, between you and yourself. Don't give up. A sahabi came to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Team, Ya Rasulullah, I do a sin and I repent. And I do a sin and I repent. And I do a sin and I repent. Until when? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him, Hatta yakuna shaytanu huwa al madhur. Until the shaytan is defeated. Yani keep doing your tawbah, your tawbah until you defeat the shaytan. And don't allow the shaytan to defeat you. So that's the idea. Right? This is the idea to continue, to keep going. So when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that the heart who repels and pushes away al-fitna, he earns a white dot in his heart. He's working towards a polished, purified heart because that's what you want to meet Allah Azza wa Jal with. You want to meet him with a pure heart. That's what's going to benefit. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ On that day, no wealth and no children will be of benefit. These two things were mentioned specifically because they're the dearest and the most closest to a person. His wealth and his children. That won't be of benefit. What will benefit then? إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Except who came on the day of judgment with a heart that is salim, meaning a pure heart, a heart that's polished and cleansed and purified. You see the heart that Allah Azza wa Jal gave you when you were first born? That heart was pure, right? Came out, said, had no clue about this worldly life, what a sin is, nothing, nothing. You have to meet Allah Azza wa Jal with a heart, the heart of a baby. Because that's the heart that Allah Azza wa Jal gave you, right? And this is why there are a lot of good deeds in Islam that earn you a forgiveness as though a newborn, right? Like Al-Hajj, you come back from Al-Hajj as though a newborn. And did you know? Every single salat that you pray, fard or voluntary, in where you are concentrated on what you recite, is you being reborn. Hada hadith sahih. Hada hadith sahih in sahih Muslim. Hadith of Amr uh, ibn Abbas al Sulami radiallahu anhu. Right? Raja'a min dhunubihi kahi atihi yawma waladatu ummu. Every salat 
is a chance to be reborn. Every salat purifies and polishes that heart. So every fitna you repel is working towards a white heart that is going to benefit you. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, until the hearts become of two types. Qalbun aswadu mirbaddan kalkuzi mujakhiyah. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said, Qalbun abiyadu mithla as-safa, la tadurruhu fitnatun ma damat as-samawat wal-ard. The first heart is going to be a white heart, crystal, polished. It will never be affected by any fitna, so long as the heavens and the earth are up. Khalas, that Allah gives him immense protection. And another heart is going to be black, aswad. It's going to be black and an upside down vessel, like this. That's how it was described. A black heart that is like an upside down vessel. What does that mean? You see, the vessel, if it's like this, you can fill it up with water. Water is something good. But if you turn the vessel upside down and you try to pour on it, can anything go into the vessel? No, it just comes out. So the heart will become that black, that destroyed, that even if you wanted to fill it with good, it just won't settle. That heart cannot learn good manners anymore, good ethics. It cannot learn worship anymore. Khalas, it's dirty, it's diseased. And what's the sign that a person has this upside down vessel black heart? What's the sign? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the sign is, huh? لا يعرف معروفا ولا ينكر منكرا إلا ما أشرب من هواه. He said that person now لا يعرف معروف. He will not recognize the good and the pure. ولا ينكر منكرا. And he will not be able to recognize that which is filthy and dirty. إلا ما أشرب من هواه. Except what suits his desire. So if he saw a good deed as something good, it's not because Allah loves it, but it's because that's what he desired. And if he saw a sin as something bad, it's not because Allah hates it, but it's because he doesn't desire it. Allahu Akbar. That's the sign that the heart has died and become an upside down vessel. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, the believer should understand that al-fitan are all around us and there are means and ways to protect yourself. Some we mentioned and I give you some more. From them is to understand and know the plan and the plot of the devils of mankind and jinn kind. Firstly, you need to know how do I identify a fitna and a sin? Because when you know what the fitna is, then you will keep away from it. Long time ago, sins and fitan were easily recognized. Today, it's very difficult to identify a fitna and something that is evil. You know why? Because the shaitan has done a very good job to decorate the fitan and the sins. Today, the sin is not identified in society as a sin. It's decorated. And it's covered and it's hidden really well. And this is the trick of a shaitan from day one. With Adam alayhi salam. You know Allah azza wa jal, he said to Adam and his wife Hawa, لا تقرب هذه الشجرة. Do not come near this tree. This is a sin. You know the tree that was in the paradise was a sin. Allah azza wa jal said, do not come near the tree. Shaitan, you know what he did? How did Adam end up eating from the tree, alayhi salam? You know how? A shaytan whispered to Adam, and he said to him, هَلْ أَدُلُّكَ عَلَى شَجَرَةِ الْخُلْدِ Do you want me to direct you, give you directions towards the tree of eternity? Oh, شَجَرَةِ الْخُلْدِ He decorated it. He changed its name. Here it's a cursed, evil tree. He changed its name. He called it the tree of eternity. What does that mean, tree of eternity? It means, أَن Meaning, if you eat from it, 
then both of you are either going to become Malakain, two angels, or Khalidin, you'll remain in here forever. How deceptive is that? And how decorative is that? And how beautiful does that sound? See what the shaitan did? He took a filthy, nasty deed and he decorated it by changing the name. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says at the end of time, people will drink alcohol, yusammunahu bighayr ismi. They will give it a name other than its name. And that's true. Alcohol today is called spirits. In Arabic, they call it mashrubat ruhiyyah. Like spiritual drinks. It's like if you're feeling down, you drink it and you'll come back up. That's how it is. That's how it's presented. Look at drugs. Drugs, no one calls it drugs. They call it in its specific names. Ice with speed. You say hack ice. Imagine hack ice in a, in a, in a cup of water. I think it seems nice. Speed. Hack, you get some, some rush into your life. Ecstasy. What does ecstasy mean? You know what ecstasy means? Oh, open the dictionary. It means happiness. How did the word drug end up being happiness? Right? And here I I was told of something else called balloon. (laughs) Balloon. (laughs) That that innocent balloon. Who, by the way, it's it's halal to blow the balloon, but now it's haram to inhale the balloon. Well, I will suck the balloon and what's in it. But this is what the shaitan does. That's the first step. And if you're not aware of this, you'll fall into it. You must know that he has decorated the deeds and he has changed their reality. Homosexuality is not called that anymore. It's called love. Love is love. And painted with rainbow colors. Right? That's the idea. A zina is not called zina. It's called the adult entertainment. Personal services. That's its name. Murder, which is the murder of a child that's in the womb of the mother, past four months, called abortion. Abortion, it's like you're undergoing a task and just abort it, no problems. But that's called murder. That in Islam is called murder for anything above four months. And this idea comes from where? From feminism. That this is my body, my choice. I do what I like. This is the ID. The sins, their name has changed. And you know, Allah, you travel in the airplane, and some planes, they have a wine list, a wine list. I give you this so you can understand how well a shaitan has decorated the sin. You open up the wine list. Have you ever read how they describe the wines? Should I give you one? It says, the 1998 bears scents of black raspberry, dried cherry, prunes, and wood smoke, medium bodied and well structured with evolved notes of tobacco and dried leaves, adding complexity. Sure. And when it comes to oranges, it's just orange juice, apple juice, water. And then when you read this, you think, Allahu Akbar, what's this? I wonder how this tastes. Cherry with raspberry with prunes and wood smoke and show the shaitan what he's done. There's an entire paragraph when we describe a bottle of wine. And then we need to be careful what the shaitan has been doing. Shaitan has decorated the sins for them and their actions for them. The people of Sabah, when they worship the moon or when they worship the sun, when the Hudud, the bird, came back to Sulaiman and said, Ya'buduna, yasjuduna li shams, they are prostrating to the sun. Why? Shaitan said to them, Look, this is a sun. Look how bright it is. Look how big it is. It's existed way before you people were born. It'll remain way after you die. It provides you with light and heat. Worship it. Seems to be the big boss. Worship it. And so people worshiped it. See how he decorates the sin? حتى, حتى even, I think it was Imam Al-Qasim in his tafsir, he discussed the matter of how did the shaytan decorate to Quraysh killing their baby girls? You know, Al-Wa'ad. 
وإذا الموؤودة سئلت الوأد If they were given the news that they had a baby girl They will take her and bury her in the earth والله عز وجل He says وكذلك زين لكثير من المشركين قتل أولادهم الشركاء and the devils They decorated the deed of killing their children How? I know when I read this How? How? How can it happen? You know how he decorated the deed? He said to them, oh, this is interesting. He said to them, Ibrahim alayhi salam, remember, he wanted to slaughter his son Ismail for the sake of Allah. Yalla, kill your children for the sake of Allah in the sunnah of Ibra- following the sunnah of Ibrahim. Shuf Allahu Akbar. Now I tell you, I tell you, Wallah, th- you wouldn't have ever thought of this. I couldn't think of it until I came past and read it. Shaytan has done his deed already. He knows what he's doing. And this is how he fools mankind. Even the first thing, you and I need to understand and learn and know that the first step to saving yourself from al-fitan is to know that they are not as they seem to be in society. They have been changed. Their names have been changed. And they are being pushed. And they are being normalized. And as a Muslim... Al-Wahi will never change. So that means whoever is attached to the Qur'an wal wahi he will always know what is wrong and he will always know what is right. Because no one can change the words of the Qur'an. No one can change the words in Al-Hadith. Al-Haram is Al-Haram. Allah calls it as it is. They won't change. Al-Zina is called Al-Zina. Al-Riba is called Al-Riba. Homosexuality is called Al-Fahisha. No one can change these realities. So whoever is close to the Qur'an is protected. Also, my brothers and sisters in Islam, from the means that help you deal with these modern-day fitan and protecting yourself is no doubt seeking protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't underestimate this matter. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once was, was with his companions. Imagine, this is a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the greatest of mankind sitting with the greatest of generation. You know what he said to them? He said to them, تَعَوَّذُوا بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الْفِتَنِ مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا وَمَا بَطَنْ He said to them, my companions, seek Allah's protection from the external fitan and the internal fitan. Internal fitan like insincerity, showing off, and uh, hatred, and, and jealousy, and animosity, and so on. And external fitan, which are the sins and the fitan around you. So the companions, as they're sitting, they said, "Na'udhu billahi min al-fitan ma wa ma batan." They immediately responded to the command of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they said, "Oh Allah, grant us safety and protection from the external and internal fitan." So that's the first, that's the, from the matters that will help you deal with modern day fitan. Don't underestimate this matter. A lot of people go and busy themselves. Now I want something more academic. Give me, how do I respond to this fitna? Well, how do I respond to it? Look, the vast majority of Muslims don't need this. The vast majority of Muslims, the more they get involved in the response and how do we respond to him and how do we say to him and kaza, he falls into a fitna himself. He comes running, Shaykh, my heart, there's something of al-fitna and I tried to read academic work and now I've lost myself. How do I come out of this? Yeah, it was better for you to just sit down and say, A'udhu billahi min al-fitani ma zahara mina wa ma batan. Where's that in your life? No, no, I don't want a dua. Give me something else. Something act, modern act, academic. Give me some work. Give me a podcast. Give... You don't need this stuff. And if Allah answered this dua, you have Allah's protection. What did you think? Some knowledge in a book is going to protect you more than Allah will, will protect you. So don't fool yourself. A dua is important when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches us, as in the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu an, that at the end of the salat, you make a dua. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إذا فرغ أحدكم من صلاته أو من التشهد فليقل اللهم إني أعوذ بك من عذاب النار ومن عذاب القبر ومن فتنة المحيا فتنة المحيا والممات ومن فتنة المسيح الدجال Ibn Hazm رحمه الله his opinion is that this dua is wajib. Meaning whoever doesn't say it, his salat is batil, he has to pray again. That's his opinion. Otherwise, يعني, the majority 
opinion is that it's mustahab. But I'm just giving you to appreciate how important this dua is. Tawus, from among the tabi'een, he would ask his son, my son, after his salat, he would say to him, did you say this dua or not? If he said to him, no, he said, get up, repeat your salat. Get up, Allah, pray again and say this dua. Oh Allah, I seek your protection. Min adab al nar from the punishment of the fire and from the punishment of the grief and from the fitan of this worldly life and the fitan of death. The fitna of death is when a shaytan will have his last shot with you to cause you to doubt Allah and his messenger and al-Islam. And also the fitna of a dajjal which is the biggest of them all. Memorize this dua and be frequent upon this dua. Any fitna you come close to, it comes close to you. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Rush to that. Look at the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. When the woman, which was the wife of Al-Aziz, she had adorned herself, she dressed herself, and this was a beautiful looking woman. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَرَوَدَتُ الَّتِي هُوَ فِي بَيْتِهَا عَنْ نَفْسِهِ وَغَلَّقَتِ الْأَبْوَابِ I want you to imagine this scene. He's a young boy with complete strength and beautiful look. And this is a woman that is the wife of a king. So she's in the top position and she's a beautiful looking woman. Not only that, she locks the doors. Not aghlaqat, ghallaqat. See that shadda there? Meaning she locked it in such a manner no one could open it. That's how intense the locks were. And in addition to this, she walked up to Yusuf alayhi salam, and there's no one in the room. I said to him, hey talak. He talak. I'm prepared for you. Do what you like. I'm the wife of the king. I'll keep my mouth shut and I won't say anything. And no one can hold me to account because the higher you are uh, in, in, in society, the higher you are, the less accountable you become, right? That's how it is. That's why politicians are all corrupt. Because who can hold them to account? No one. So, she did that. Hey, Talak. Imagine a young man. And, 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 and don't think this is irrelevant. Because imagine this is you. In your own room. With a phone, with adult cont access to adult content. What do you do? What did Yusuf do? Do exactly what he did. Qala ma'adha Allah. He said, I seek Allah's protection. He said, he said, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Fasta'asam. He rushed to Allah's aid. He sought Allah's protection. When the fitna has arrived to you and it's close to you, the first thing you should utter is, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim The second thing is, what do you do? Wastabaq al-bab. He ran away. He turned and he ran. It was only a few meters before he got to the door. What happened? What happened as soon as he ran? The king, her husband, opened the door. You know him opening the door? That's relief from the fitan. Even between saying, A'udhu billahi min ash rajim and running away from the fitna, it's only a couple of seconds and relief will come. Khalas, temptation and desire is all gone. And Allah has saved you. See al-isti'adha, how important it is. Then don't forget al-isti'adha, especially during this day and age. And if you haven't memorized the dua at the end of the salat, then make every effort to memorize it and to say it and to understand its deep meaning. That if Allah Azza wa Jal was to save you and protect you from the fitna, then your iman is protected. You preserve a white, purified, clean, crystal heart. And this is exactly what you want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with. Shaykh, ma khalasna? Yes. Okay. Okay. Khalas. There is other things. Lakin, these are a few matters that inshallah ta'ala, if you hold on to, bi they will be of great and immense benefit for you. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he increase our iman and preserve our iman and our Islam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he protect us from al-fitan ma zahara minha wa ma batan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grant us a hasanah in this life, in the afterlife, and that he save us from the hellfire. 
ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا صرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما جزاكم الله خيرا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما شاء الله بارك الله فيكم uh, Brothers, if I can have your attention for a couple of more minutes and first of all we want to thank uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr Jazakallah khairan for delivering this amazing talk and which you have benefited from and uh, right now I have an amazing news uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr and uh, this is going to be also a historic moment for us and also for one of our brothers we have a young man who's about to take his shahada Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar so it's amazing Alhamdulillah the last few talks or conferences that we've had Alhamdulillah we were always witnessing, mashallah, brothers coming to the fold of Islam. And it's going to be a great honor for you to do his shahada. Mashallah, we have a young man, uh, Tariq, and who had Muslim friends in the past. And uh, one of them has passed away and he saw him in his dream. And, and uh, he said what he saw from him was amazing in his dreams. And now he's been reading the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed guidance in his heart. So he's here and he's going to take the shahada right next to you, inshallah ta'ala. So this is gonna be a great honor, inshallah ta'ala. Tarek, can I invite you to come and sit next to the Sheikh? Mashallah Sheikh, all the way from Australia, mashallah. A graduate from the Islamic University of Medina, the blessed land. So alhamdulillah, it's gonna be an amazing moment. His first, mashallah, visit to Masjid al-Furqan. And inshallah ta'ala, the first shahada as well. And hopefully whenever you come back, there will be a shahada, inshallah. Barakallah fiqh. Barakallah Mashallah. Brother, and uh, your, uh, your background is what, what, what faith you're coming from? Uh, Christian. Christian. Yeah. Christian. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My brothers and sisters in Islam, alhamdulillah, such a beautiful opportunity and a beautiful moment. Look, can you see all the smiles? Yeah. You know why I that see, is? I, see. I tell you why. This, consider it like, and in Muslims, when they have someone that accepts Islam, it's like a lost family member that has found his way back to his family, right? So this is the excitement and the joy and the happiness that fills this room tonight. So I'm going to say a few words. You're going to repeat after me, inshallah, in Arabic, word by word, and then I'll translate to you what you said. And with this word, bi-ithnillah, by the permission of Allah, you would have embraced al-Islam and became a Muslim. So let's say with me. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. An. An. La. La. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa. Illa. Allah. Allah. وَأَشْهَدُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَأَنَّ وَأَنَّ عِيسَى عِيسَى عَبْدُ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَكَلِمَتُهُ وَلَكَلِمَتُهُ أَلْقَاهَا أَلْقَاهَا إِلَى إِلَى مَرْيَمَ مَرْيَمَ وَرُوحٌ وَرُوحٌ مِنْهُ مِنْهُ Jayyid. Jazakallahu khaira. Takbir, my brothers and sisters. Takbir. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. My brother in Islam, yani let me translate to you what I said. You just uh, made a testimony. You said that I bear witness and testify that there is no Lord worthy of worship except Allah. And that Muhammad is the slave and final messenger of Allah. And that Jesus, or Isa alayhi salam, is a prophet and a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the words that you said. And with that, I give you three short uh, advices. Number one, with this, uh, yeah, in fact that you embraced Islam, all your previous bad, evil deeds have been wiped away. All of them. So you start fresh. So in reality, perhaps you are better than all of us that are sitting here tonight. And this is Allah's virtue and his favor, and he gives it to whoever he wants. Allah Azza wa Jalla, he says, Allah Azza wa Jalla, he says, tell the disbelievers, if they stop their disbelief and enter Islam, then I will forgive them for everything that has passed. So congratulations for that. Number two, because you're coming from a Christian background, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, أُولَٰئِكَ يُؤْتَوْنَ أَجْرَهُمْ مَرَّتَيْنِ بِمَا صَبَرُوا 
For every good deed that you do from now on, it's multiplied. It's doubled for you. Why? Because of the patience you're going to have to endure. And number three, I don't know how your family has reacted to this news. Are they accepting your family, your friends? I don't know. Sometimes it could be difficult. Family and friends oppose, oppose this decision and this idea of yours. If that's the case, and I don't know if that's the case, but regardless of what it is, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ سَنُدْخِلَنَّهُمْ فِي الصَّالِحِينَ Those who believe and act righteously, we will admit them among the righteous. So if you lose a family, this is your entire family. The Muslim Ummah al-Masjid here, you're going to find these people as your brothers in Islam. And this bond of brotherhood in Islam is stronger than the bond of blood brotherhood, right? So the idea is, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal that he accepts from you, and he keeps you sincere, and he keeps you firm. And don't be overwhelmed by the teachings of Islam. Slowly, easy, and surely, you will build on your relationship with Allah. You'll learn something. You'll learn the prayers. You'll learn what you have to learn. It's going to be a long journey. But it's not a matter of how quick you get there. The main thing is that you remain on the path of Islam and you die upon the path of Islam. And this is what Allah Azza wa Jal wants to see from us all. So we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to grant you firmness and steadfastness and that he make you an example for others to follow. Amen. Allah ibarak fikum wa jazakum Allahu khaira. Get up and congratulate your brother. What's your name? Tariq. Tariq. MashaAllah. 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 Congratulations. Mubarak. Mubarak. Welcome to the Brotherhood Box. Assalamu alaykum. Thank you. Thank you.